So the premise for this video might seem a little weird. Usually, death in video games is just a temporary status or obstacle, something we don't really think about that much unless it's a high-stakes Souls-like title or a strategy game with permadeath. But this video isn't about death as a mechanic in games. I won't be discussing whether game deaths or game over screens are going extinct, or how they help construct flow experiences for players. There's already been a lot of great essays on the design of death in games. Right now, I want to look at death in games through the lens of positive media psychology, and ask how video games, as interactive stories, can help us confront and accept real-life mortality. So that's a lot. And I know one of the initial questions might be, wait, what do you mean confront mortality? Is that something we have to do? Thinking about our own death is hard. It's a skill most of us don't get enough practice with. Often we avoid thinking about our mortality altogether for years because it's too scary. In many modern societies, we actually censor each other from talking about death or dying seriously. We chuckle nervously, change subjects, or tell children to not talk about those things because it's morbid. As a result, we treat death and dying as a boogeyman we all agree to pretend isn't there, too afraid that looking at it or talking about it will invoke its wrath. But studies show that the more we normalize and challenge ourselves to confront the ideas and practicalities around death, the less scary it becomes and the more stable our general sense of peace, life satisfaction, and well-being becomes. And, historically speaking, getting used to thinking about mortality in a calm and accepting way is also a main tenet of many philosophies humans have practiced for thousands of years in an effort to lead happier and more mindful lives. The other question to address before jumping into my list would be, how can a game teach us to confront death or teach us anything at all? Games are just supposed to be fun, right? Educational games are boring or just useful for schoolwork. Well, we know that's not quite true. Some of the most rewarding and psychologically educational gaming experiences we can have aren't exactly painless fun rides. Media psychologists have already discovered that the immersive qualities of gaming can actually create perfect learning opportunities not just for school topics, but for strengthening emotional intelligence skills. Take a step further into the research, and we find that video games with nuanced and complex narratives can actually help us gain genuine psychological growth. You've probably experienced this in some way. You might remember finishing a game and feeling something new or different, or that your old perspectives had been challenged. While there are lots of games that tackle grief, loss, and post-traumatic stress or growth, I want to focus on games in this list that could teach the player about accepting their own death. This is a list of games that can be tools for us to get used to thinking more frequently and more calmly about our own mortality and exercise more self-compassion and patience when untangling our anxieties around the journey we will all go on someday. So as a disclaimer, because of the nature of this video, I don't recommend watching it if you've struggled with suicide ideation. This video is meant for those who have experienced death anxiety or have phobias related to death or end-of-life situations or if you're just curious. What Remains of Edith Finch is probably the most famous game on this list, and although I've made a full video exploring the characters and their relationships with death and death anxiety, I want to cover a few of those points here from a slightly different angle. In What Remains of Edith Finch, you play as Edith Finch Jr. as she returns to her family's abandoned ancestral home, the lone survivor of a family with a legendary relationship with death. As Edith, we explore the house and unlock secrets. We revisit how each of our family members had died and the lives they had led. Any supernatural elements of the game, like the curse that was supposedly responsible for everyone's death, remain unconfirmed. But what we get instead is a narrative of characters that might remind us of some very real people in our lives, or even ourselves. My previous analysis focused on the family members that lived long enough to quote, survive the curse for some time and looked at how they conceived of and related to the idea of their own looming death. This would be Sam, Walter, Edith Jr.'s mom, and Edith Jr. Many of these characters did everything they could to avoid death and even to avoid thinking about it. In this way, what seemed to truly haunt the family wasn't the knowledge that they would die someday. That's the knowledge we all live with after all. It was the fact that the family never established open communication around death and loss. Each family member, relatably, was left to reinvent the wheel themselves on how to confront their own mortality with lots of panic, pain, and loneliness. 
Negative behaviors were reinforced by Edith Sr., and neutral behaviors were constructed alone and ignored by the matriarch. The real tragedy of the story was the unnecessary pain, suffering, and confusion that the family suffered because death talk was somehow never normalized in their very death-obsessed household. So how does this game help us confront our death? The family in this game helps us realize that maybe we've been tucking away our death anxiety in a dark closet somewhere too, and it's only grown larger and scarier from our neglect. We might see through their stories that we, like the Finches, have been making life decisions steered either consciously or subconsciously by our death anxiety. We, like Walter, might be living in our own underground cave of sorts, becoming consumed by the need to control and escape any risk in our lives, even at the cost of our relationships with others. And we, like Edith Jr.'s mom, might be neglecting talking about illness, dying, or dead loved ones with family members who need to know and learn from us how to be more comfortable with mortality. Or we, like Edie Sr., might even be encouraging or reinforcing unhealthy death anxiety behaviors in ourselves or others. This game reminds us that even if we're not a finch, our feelings around death influence our real lives and what we do with our time on Earth, whether we're aware of it or not. This realization is the first step to recognize how important it is to stop running from talking or thinking about mortality, a habit that feeds our death anxiety. And to avoid the pain and confusion of rampant fear and anxiety, we can begin charting a future where we don't let our fears around mortality push us into unhealthy or avoidant thoughts, behaviors, or habits. As a result, this game can help us realize that we need to normalize calm, compassionate language with ourselves and loved ones about the journey we're all on to construct a meaningful life towards a very natural ending. Spiritfarer deserves a video for itself to explore the story and characters completely, but what I want to briefly cover are the benefits we can gain from just a few short hours in the game. The premise of Spiritfarer is that you're replacing the mythological Charon. Your responsibility is to guide departed souls to the Ephedor, where once they're ready, they will move on. Sometimes spirits aren't ready to move on, and so you help these spirits by comforting them with shelter, good meals, conversation, hugs, and helping them confront and process fears and regrets that are keeping them here. The player is encouraged to take care of their spirit guests and constantly consider their needs until you start to feel attached to them. But the important part is that there's always the understanding that their time with you is finite, and that your goal is to eventually help them leave you. This premise alone is not only beautiful, but very helpful. After a few hours of playing, figuring out everyone's favorite meals, learning more about their pasts, and sharing some heartwarming moments, even if you want to keep them with you, the game is built to encourage you to let them go. This is unique in our entertainment culture where we usually create artificial immortality for our favorite characters, and death is never permanent. In my opinion, Spiritfarer gives us a much healthier perspective on life and death. The goal of the game is setting up good, meaningful, and peaceful departures for our spirit friends. And all of the management mechanics of the game remind us that it's important to prioritize relationships and the healing of regrets over the fear of death. Our spirit guests learn that it's much better to work through their fears and sorrows than to be controlled and stunted by them. What Spiritfarer does for us is reframe how we think about death. In this game, death isn't a fail state or considered a bad ending. The departure of your spirit friends is communicated as being natural, beautiful, and meaningful. If we play this game mindfully, we can incorporate this very useful perspective into our worldview on death and get important practice seeing the end of our journey as a natural and meaningful step instead of something unnatural or terrifying. Far From Noise is probably the easiest and the hardest game to play on this list. All you do mechanically is select dialogue options for about two hours. But emotionally and psychologically, you're ushered into confronting what many people find the scariest part of death, the near-death experience. You play a character whose car, while driving along a seaside cliff, dies and you end up teetering onto a cliff edge. You and your car are perfectly balanced between certain death and the possibility of escaping and living another day. But the balance is so fragile that even trying to move within the cabin or opening a door might cause it to fall. 
Your character is stuck in this terrifying near-death situation for hours. This alone is a deeply uncomfortable scenario, but the reality of the gameplay is actually very calming. Throughout the two-hour story, you listen to the ocean, the wind, the birds, the music, and even the gentle rocking of the car is so calming you could almost fall asleep. At first, you're simply choosing what to tell yourself to either calm down or to panic. But this game does offer a lot of invisible challenges as well. One of the first challenges for both the player and the character is quickly coming to terms with just how easily this life or death situation came up. How simple and pedestrian the end of life might look when it's an everyday accident like this. This kind of situation alone is a great source of anxiety for many people who want to avoid death by avoiding risk. But it is a sobering reality players could benefit from remembering and exploring. Just because our death might come up unexpectedly or in such a simple equation, it's still good practice to try and accept the very realistic fragility of our own mortality now while we're currently safe, since it could spare us a lot of discomfort, panic, or death anxiety in the long run. The gameplay takes a turn into the surreal when our character starts talking with a deer that happens across our unfortunate situation. We're not sure if the deer is really talking, or if it's a supernatural being, or if it's just our anxiety-riddled brain creating a hallucination. But whatever the deer is, it's very calm and very wise. It's not particularly worried for us, and it doesn't try to help, but it keeps us company. Our conversation with it quickly goes from, oh my god, a talking deer, to, am I going to die here, to, what's the point of life? After some time, you might realize that although the deer can't help us out of our situation, he can help us be a little less afraid of it and to see the beauty around us. He immediately goes to work teaching us about appreciating the present moment and imparts some very comforting, almost Buddhist perspectives on life and death. But one of the most important points this game provides the player very early on is this great sense of what death actually feels like in a real life context. While you're teetering in the car inches from the end, your character realizes that the world is just carrying on like normal. The birds are unbothered, the butterflies innocently float from flower to flower, squirrels visit the tree next to you, and the waves below you continue to push and pull like nothing's going on. Death, in the greater context, isn't how we see in the movies. We often portray death and dying in our stories as apocalyptic and earth-shattering. If we come from an individualistic society, we might hate the idea that the world wouldn't crumble with grief or outrage when we die. It could shake us to our core that the squirrels would continue to forage, the waves would continue to crash, and that it might actually be beautiful weather outside and strangers a mile away could currently be enjoying a nice meal as we slip away. But Far From Noise reminds us kindly that this is how it is for everyone. We, like everyone and everything else in this world, we're always going to pass away. This game invites us, with its beautiful sounds and atmosphere, to stop cursing the world for carrying on without us but instead to transform that frustration into a gratitude that the world will continue to be beautiful, complex, and unshakable when we die. Our stag friend teaches us that, at least in this moment, we're alive. In this moment, we're breathing and blessed with beauty around us. And that is enough. We're reminded that we don't need to sacrifice the opportunity to see beauty or joy around us or meaning in our lives right now simply because we're afraid of dying one day. A wonderful addition to this Zen death acceptance is the deer's reminder that accepting death doesn't mean remaining passive or just sitting in your car waiting for it to get you. You'll still need to think practically after calming yourself to try and prolong your life, of course. And I won't say here whether or not you escape the car or if you're meant for death in this game, but I will remind players that no matter what happens at the end, if we opened our minds, we will still have learned something very valuable that can help us in real life when contemplating our own mortality. Even if we, as the player, are nowhere near danger as we play this game in the safety of our own homes, this game invites us to teeter on the edge for a moment. By prolonging a near-death situation into a few hours for the players, we get useful practice in calming our fight-or-flight response that we get when thinking about our own mortality. We're asked to take a seat with these thoughts, invite them into our minds like strangers, and try to befriend them. This game could trigger deep death or existential anxiety in some players, but this game could also be a fortifying experience to practice approaching scary ideas in a safe, calming space, kind of like exposure therapy. 
For players who have built up their resilience against death anxiety, this game serves as a relaxing, beautiful guided meditation on death and dying. I highly recommend playing this game if you feel ready to practice accepting your personal mortality and need some help thinking about the meaning of life and death on a grander scale. The Graveyard's been called less of a game and more of an interactive painting. Released over a decade ago in 2008, it's a very fleeting experience that only lasts a few minutes. In the graveyard, the playable character is a very old woman visiting a cemetery. The experience is slow-paced, and all you do is move the woman towards her destination, which is a nearby bench. But the player can receive one of two different endings. Either the woman rests on the bench for a while, and after a song plays, you can exit the graveyard again, or while resting on the bench, she quietly faints and passes away. Some players have called this the bad ending, but the developers seem to hint that the death ending was their original goal for the game. This piece was created as an argument against the typical use of death in video games. The developers aim to bring death into a game and allow it to keep its quiet and natural significance. For an independent title released in 2008, even with a simple setup, it's clear they put a lot of effort into making this experience. This experience was meant to put players in an emotionally meaningful moment with the idea of death. When we interact with this vignette, we're being gently and quietly reminded that death is real and someday, we like the old lady, won't get back up again. But that it's okay, because death is a very natural part of life. Like with Far From Noise, I recommend playing this title to visit the moment of closure, to visit what our endings might look like, and meditate on just how simple and normal the business of passing away really is. The games on this list so far have been titles that encourage us to think about our feelings around death and dying. This last game, A Mortician's Tale, is also full of death-related themes, but I wanted to include it here as a tool for learning more about the practicalities around death. In A Mortician's Tale, you play as a mortician as she starts her new job. Your day consists of reading lots of emails between you, your friend, your co-workers, and your boss, along with interesting newsletters about different kinds of funerals and ways to be buried or cremated. You also embalm and prepare bodies or cremated remains for funerals. You can then attend services and speak to family members who have eclectic but realistic reactions to the sad occasion. This game offers a great education on our burial options and insight into how society's deliberate blind spot around death has led to unreformed, environmentally unsafe burial practices. I hadn't known about most of what I learned from this game before playing it because society has made any interest or discussion about these topics inappropriate or weird. But playing this game actually taught me about environmentally friendly burial options that I'm considering for myself and reinforced my understanding that it's never too early to set up a will or advance directive. And that's what this game really accomplishes for us. It encourages us to think practically and calmly about the end of our life, to start considering what we want and how to get it, and how to set up what our loved ones need once we're gone. The more familiar we are with these end-of-life practicalities and processes, the less mysterious and scary they and even the process of dying become. By becoming more educated and developing a plan for what you want done with your remains, you're gifting yourself a greater sense of ownership over the end of your journey. Fears about what will happen to our body or loved ones are some of the most powerful triggers for death anxiety. This game can be a great resource to get started in planning out what we need for ourselves and our family, like what we want on our will, or where we want our remains to be put to rest, or how the services can be paid for and who receives our assets. Having these things in order can do a lot to put our minds at ease and take the edge off of our fear of dying if we know our loved ones and remains will be taken care of. Each of these games offer us something unique. We can learn to be more aware of how our fear of death is directing our lives. We can learn new and more compassionate ways to view death and departure. We can practice meditating on our eventual end and begin refining our fears of death into a gratitude for life. And we can learn more about how to take care of our practical needs around death as well. The journey to accepting our mortality and befriending our fears is a long one with lots of bumps and U-turns. But at the end, we might find the freedom to live with a little less pain, a little less fear, and more gratitude for the life, relationships, and inherent beauty we have here in the present moment. 
Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more about video games in the intersection of media psychology and positive psychology, please go ahead and subscribe. If you have any games you'd like to suggest, please go ahead and add them in the comments below. And as always, happy playing.